Howard Pyle was born on March 5, 1853 into a strong Quaker heritage. Howard's ancestors came from England for the fertile farmlands of southeastern Pennsylvania and the northern rim of Delaware. His childhood home stood on ample grounds with fields surrounding it, several miles from the center of Wilmington. The garden was a delight from his childhood and became one of his fondest memories, springing to life again and again in many of his pictures and stories. Like the garden, the old house was a cherished memory. It was a filled stone farmhouse in three sections, the oldest dating from about 1740, the second from the time of the Revolution, and the third a new addition built by Howard's father at the time of the Civil War. Howard's mother was a reader and thinker. She had ambitions for a literary or artistic career for her children. She supplied the home with books, Dickens and Thackeray, Shakespeare and Milton. Later, Pyle wrote of his early reading days. My mother was very fond of pictures and books. A number of prints hung on the walls of our house, but we, my mother and I, liked the pictures and the books the best of all. I may say to you in confidence that even to this very day, I still like the pictures you can find in books better than wall pictures. Midway in Howard's childhood, the pile leather business fell upon bad times and the country house was sold. They moved to a smaller house in the city where fortunately most of the pile relatives and friends lived. Mrs. Pyle was consoled that Howard could be sent to a good school. Howard walked to the Friends' school nearby. His parents were disappointed in their son's scholastic performance. Howard read widely but showed little interest in his lessons. His parents enrolled him in a small private school, but made no difference. He was physically active and was now in the habit of roaming the city. He couldn't resist the large transatlantic steamers en route to Philadelphia. Steam had largely taken over, but there were still a number of sailing vessels of many sizes. This visual and functional ship knowledge would be used in his later years. Along with the docks, there were blacksmith shops carriage and wagon shops and fire stations Howard could browse. Howard's taste was in popular British media. British illustrations were superior in quality and quantity than American production. British illustrators were so accomplished at this time that the middle years of the 19th century they were called the illustrators of the 60s. It was upon this rich material that young Howard's mind was influenced. This was almost entirely a monochrome picture world with every drawing passed under the wood engraver's burn before arriving at the printing press. The qualities making Howard's future began to emerge in his teenage years, a zest for drawing, a love of fantasy and the heroic, and an unmistakable growth of a rich inner life. However, his parents could not help but think in terms of a conventional education and in that area Howard was lackluster. They thought that a few years of college would permit a career, even in writing or art, but his scholastic record would not permit college entrance. Home studies centering upon Latin and mathematics was founded to repair deficiencies, but enthusiasm soon tapered off into the old habits of sketching, reading, or daydreaming. The alternative was art school, hardly a 40-minute train ride away in Philadelphia. Howard became a student of a small private school, for reasons unknown, the oldest art school in the country, the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, was not chosen. Regardless, at about 16, Howard became a regular commuter to Philadelphia. Howard immediately applied himself, studying technique and training his eye to measure distances. After a while, he realized he was the most accomplished student in the school. But after three years, Howard decided he reached the limits of what Antwerp trained artist and tutor Mr. Van der Wellen had to give, and he returned home to an improvised studio helping his father in the leather trade. Uncertain of his talents, he wrote little stories but tore them up in dissatisfaction along with the sketches he made to illustrate the stories. The 
There seemed to have been a time of doubt and drifting, but better times were on their way. For years, Howard heard of the annual roundup of wild ponies on the island of Chincoteague off the Virginia coast. It was an event he had wanted to witness, and it seemed interesting enough for an attempt by Howard to create an illustrated article. In the spring of 1876, he journeyed down the eastern shore peninsula. He sketched the pony roundup in the ensuing sale and auction. Back in Wilmington, he put the same care into his writing. It was the most ambitious illustrated writing project Howard had undertaken. At the same time, he finished two of his smaller projects. One was an amusing idea about a magic pill that transformed an old fretful parson into a terrible boy. When a letter of acceptance and a check arrived soon after, he was elated. Howard then mailed his second small effort, A Fairy Tale for Children, to St. Nicholas, a popular children's magazine of the day. It seemed incredible when that too was accepted and a check enclosed. He put his finishing touches on the Chincoteague article and sent it off to Scribner's. Shortly after was a third acceptance, on condition that his sketches be redrawn by a staff artist for proper reproduction. On a business trip to New York, Howard's father stopped at the Scribner offices. He was welcomed by the magazine's president, Roswell Smith, and after complimenting Howard's work, Smith said that American publishing faced an optimistic future and needed gifted writers and illustrators. Mr. Pyle came away with the impression that Scribner's would provide enough work to keep his son busy. Howard rode north on the New York Express in October 1876. Jammed with the hopeful, the greedy, and the ambitious from both America and abroad, at 23 he was hardly prepared for the reality of New York. Fortunately, he had no difficulty finding comfortable lodgings with the former neighbor of his mother, a Mrs. Marshall. As soon as he was settled, he went downtown to make himself known at Scribner's and St. Nicholas. It is likely that he expected too much, but he was disappointed at Scribner's. Roswell Smith was kind but had no immediate work suitable for young Howard. However, after discovering that he had a good tenor voice and could read music, he offered him a paid position in his church choir. Howard, however, refused to accept money for a church activity. Smith promised to offer him small illustration jobs from time to time, and eventually he kept his promise. The interview with Mary Mapes Dodge, the editor of St. Nicholas Magazine, was more helpful. The periodical magazine for children was growing rapidly and Mrs. Dodge recognized a promising talent and saw that the young man had a captivating imagination. Howard went back to his lodgings, instructed by Mrs. Dodge to make sketches and submit them to St. Nicholas. His many letters home alternate between enthusiasm and discouragement but generally show that he was working hard. From time to time he noted small cells and he did not have to ask for help. Howard was separated from his familiarity, but his personality won him many new friends. Though initially disappointing for Howard, Roswell Smith proved a real friend. He read the young man's writings and offered his seasoned critique. Smith also invited Howard to his house for a conversation and meals. Smith encouraged Scribner's art editor to use Pyle's drawings where possible and warned Howard of distractions in the big city. If you are going to have to try to make an artist sufficiently good to illustrate exclusively for us, you'll have to give up society entirely for the present and devote your whole attention to study. As the Christmas season approached, Howard's mood became despondent. Mrs. Dodge was dissatisfied with the way his drawings were being reproduced and sent him to an engraving house to get some advice about preparing his work. He was also advised by Scribner's to join a class to improve his drawing. As the new year opened, Howard emerged from the feeling of being out of favor to the simple realization that he had overstocked St. Nicholas and Scribner's and that it was unrealistic to place all his hopes on just two sources. He went back to work providing samples to show other editors. His goal was not to copy, but to interpret and imagine. This concept, just perceived, was to become the future keystone of his work. In 
With a new portfolio, visiting with different art editors seemed promising. His reception at Harper's was particularly warm. Charles Parsons, the Harper's art editor, had assembled a prized group of artists on his staff. It was generally acknowledged that Harper's had the best team in the country and Howard was seeing American engraving at its best. Howard could study every stage of the process and soon realized how many skilled hands a picture passed before it reached the readers. This study of the process provided Howard with confidence and the close association to those best in the industry provided a feeling of belonging. Howard was also able to witness the new demand across the continent for printed text and picture. Results emerged from Young Pyle's new confidence and determination. The group at Harper's were his new friends and they all seemed confident in Howard's abilities sensing his future would be a bright one. Parsons was buying enough idea sketches from Howard to take care of his financial needs, but always the sketches were developed to a finished and reproducible state by one of the regular staff members. Howard was disturbed and provoked by this. Finally, he acted. In his own words, he speaks of his work titled, A Wreck in the Offing. I begged Mr. Parsons to allow me to make that picture instead of handing it over. With some reluctance, he told me I might try, and that, in the event of my failure, Harper's would pay me $10. I worked upon it somewhat over six weeks, and I might indeed have been working upon it today, finding it impossible to satisfy myself with it. But with the cost of my models and the expense of living in New York reduced myself to my last five cent piece in the world, forced me to take the drawing down to Harper's. I think it was not until I stood at the awful presence of the art editor himself that I realized how this might be the turning point of my life, that I realized how great was to be the result of his decision on my future endeavor. I think I have never passed such a moment of intense trepidation a moment of such confused and terrible blending of hope and despair at the same time. I recall just how the art editor looked at me over his spectacles, and to my perturbed mind it seemed that he was weighing in his mind, for he was a very tender man, how best he might break the news to me of my unsuccess. The rebound was almost too great when he told me Mr. Harper had liked the drawing very much and that they were going to use it in the weekly. But when he said they were not only going to use it, but were going to make of it a double page cut, my exaltation was so great that it seemed to me that I knew not where I was standing or what had happened to me. As I went away, I walked on air. At last, Howard proceeded from apprentice to professional. There was no more doubt about the direction of his career. This single-mindedness proved a heavily productive period, an indication of the years to come. Harper's considered him a regular contributor of both pictures and texts, and so did St. Nicholas. Likewise, his circle of friends and acquaintances was growing, and his schedule was crowded and stimulating. He was also still attending a night class in art school. Harper's was keeping him busy and making use of his growing competence. He could now afford better quarters, and he found a large room with a north light and two side windows overlooking Broadway. It was within a quarter hour's walk of Harper's and two blocks from Scribner's. However, this proved to be only for a short while. A proper atmosphere to write his proposed book on Robin Hood, the quieter pace of Wilmington was infinitely preferable. Three years earlier, the apprehensive young man who left for New York now came back to Wilmington and acknowledged professional. Howard was a young celebrity in a town that was now growing into a city. His mother contributed odds and ends of family furniture and saw that the studio made on the third floor of the pile home was kept clean. Along with the cabinet for materials, the inevitable easel and drawing table were added, though the easel was little used in those early days. Howard was usually bent over his drawing board. Although he was busy at his drawing board most of the time, he now had longer intervals for reading. Tracking down historical details for both his painting and his prose became part of his schedule. Both Harper's and Scrivener's were sending him work, and every spare moment 
was devoted to the drawing and text for his Robin Hood project. At the same time Harper was launching a new magazine for children, Harper's Young People, and Howard was becoming one of their favorite contributors. The Wilmington community had organized a lyceum where they could sing, debate, produce plays, and listen to visiting lectures or performers. The group choir needed another tenor, and Pyle had a local reputation before he left for New York. After being persuaded to join, Howard arrived early at the first rehearsal held at the home of the Poole family. The door was opened by Anne, the Poole's young daughter, and from then on Howard became a regular visitor. Their engagement was announced only a few weeks later in July of 1880, and the following spring in April they were married. The couple was popular and admired. Anne was attractive and possessed a winning personality, and though his hair was already thinning, the blue-eyed Howard was tall and handsome. Anne's mother and father wanted the newlyweds to live with them for a while, and a room was furnished for Howard's studio. When the summer approached, the two were left alone in the big house, for the pools always spent long summers in their vacation cottage by the sea. After a few years, Howard was able to afford a beach cottage for his own growing family. A son, Sellers, was born in 1882 and a daughter, Phoebe, four years later. A small wooden studio was built behind the house in the trees and now, after a hard day's work, he could be within a few steps on the beach and into the water. The small children thrived there and Howard, hearing the voices of their mother and his kids, could be tempted to drop his pen and join them. His work didn't suffer. On the contrary, he had never been more productive and was consistently at his best. Between commissions, he worked on the manuscript and pen drawings for Robin Hood. With its completion, his work habits were established and they persisted until his last working days. For example, once an initial composition had been satisfactorily sketched, he liked to be read to while he developed the picture. In 1883, The Merry Adventures of Robin Hood was published simultaneously in England and America and was a great satisfaction to Howard. Not only because the subject was from English folklore, but because he had great admiration for English illustration. When he read the favorable reviews, particularly William Morris's surprised admiration that anything so good should come out of America, he felt proud of his work. The American reviews were equally good. This was his first lengthy project either in words or pictures. With the publication of The Merry Adventures of Robin Hood in 1883, Howard Pyle became viewed by the public as first-rank writer and illustrator for children's books. The success of Robin Hood opened the way to other books. In 1886 appeared Pepper and Salt or Seasoning for Young Folk. Two years later in 1888 appeared The Wonder Clock. The Wonder Clock with its subtitle Four and Twenty Marvelous Tales, one for each hour of the day, was a combination of prose and verse. But this time, their verses with their pen decorations were the work of Howard's sister, Catherine Pyle. Two books were published in 1895, Twilight Land, a product of Howard researching a wide range of material, especially from the Eastern world, and also the garden behind the moon. Dedicated to his firstborn, Sellers, the seven-year-old died unexpectedly from croup in 1889. The Garden Behind the Moon told the story about the dwelling place of children in the afterlife. Naturally, it was one of Howard's most touching works. In it live little children who play and romp and laugh and sing, and are as merry and happy as the little white lambs in the green meadow in springtime. In it was the little boy whom I love best of all. He did not see me, but I saw him. Two decades after the publication of Robin Hood, Howard began retelling the story of the King Arthur legends. The project was the most taxing that he had ever attempted. Work on the text and drawings was fitted between his magazine commitments, other book illustrations, and several mural commissions. The illustrations rose to the level of their epic subject, and although it was the Sir Thomas Mallory's version that was his principal source, Howard made no particular attempt to imitate the Mallory prose. The four books, The Story of King Arthur and His Knights, The Story of the Champions of the Round Table, The Story of Sir Lancelot and His Companions, and The Story of the Grail and the Passing of Arthur, appeared in intervals between 1903 and 1910. 
In one richly productive period of about four years, he wrote an adult adventure story and a pirate thriller, two children's books, a folktale in verse, and his finest book of historical fiction for children. At the same time, he was writing a handful of smaller articles for magazines. A number of historical pieces like The Early Quakers in England and Pennsylvania, and Buccaneers and Marooners of the Spanish Main. Travel pieces like A Peculiar People and short stories such as Squire's Trips, Old Armchair. Often he was working on two writing projects at the same time. Throughout his career, Howard had a growing inclination to teach and at last Pyle decided to act. There was no established art school in Wilmington, but in nearby Philadelphia was the prestigious Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts the oldest art school in the country. It was natural that Howard should offer his services to the academy, but he was refused. His view of the academy's denial was that the academy was solely concerned with the fine arts and illustration was not considered on the same level, a tenet that was opposite of Pyle's own conviction that illustration was indeed fine art. Shortly after the rebuff, a teaching offer came from the Drexel Institute of Art, Science, and Industry. In late 1894, President Dr. James McAllister offered suitable terms, complete charge of a course, and generous classroom space and equipment. The result was an instant success. Pyle's name attracted many applicants, but since only advanced students were accepted, filtered by a mandatory examination and drawing, the class was brought down to 39. Howard's warmth, knowledge, and pragmatic approach captivated students from the beginning. However, in 1900, Pyle summarized his current situation. There are only one or two who can really receive the instruction which I give. To impart this instruction to these two or three who can receive it appears to be unfair to the others who do not receive such particular instruction. This apparent favoritism upon my part must inevitably tend to disrupt the art school. So I read the letter Pyle wrote to the president in 1900 submitting his resignation. The resignation was not a step backward for Pyle as a teacher, as he wrote to a friend just a few weeks prior. It now remains to turn my acquired knowledge of teaching to some real account. To this end, the following plan has suggested itself to me, that I build here in Wilmington a studio or set of studios adjoining my own studio, that I gather together in these studios some six or nine pupils, singling them out, not from Philadelphia alone, but from the larger schools in other cities such as New York, Boston, and Chicago. I propose giving my instruction gratuitously, expecting the students to pay only a small rental to cover the interest on the money invested in the building. They would, besides, have to pay for their models and for heating the building in winter. Beyond this, there would be no expense for instruction. In his students, Pyle looked for more than just talent, but also for character, general intelligence, ambition, and health. Pyle developed an uncanny instinct for judging potential, and he made only a few unfulfilled judgments. He looked in the submitted drawings for an inner purpose, for imagination, and a hint of individuality. His reasoning was expressed in two sentences. When you apply for membership to the school, don't send me samples of your work, send examples. There are no samples of art. Howard surmounted the obstacles of building studios and organizing a new school, and in 1901, everything was ready. Pyle's advanced students were always allowed to select their own sketching locations, but most chose to follow the daily group so as to be within reach of the master's criticisms. Although Howard delighted in the informal life of the outdoor months, he was a strict teacher. He was giving freely of his own time and energy, and he had his own keen sense of when to relax and when to work. The words of the teacher can be repeated, but the magnetism behind them surely transformed the work of the students. Paint your pictures by means of the lights. Lights define texture and color. Shadows define form. And also, I criticize these compositions by analysis, but an illustration cannot be made that way. It must be made by inspiration. Make your pictures live. 
Howard trained, among others, Anna C. Wyatt, Stanley Arthurs, and Frank Schuniper. Influenced by the example of the famous painter Edwin Austin Abbey, who was friends with Howard when he first started his career in New York, he decided that he would give up illustration and devote himself to mural painting. His first important work was in 1906, the Battle of Nashville in the state capital of Minnesota, followed by two commissions in New Jersey courthouses. Howard realized his need for a familiarity with the great tradition of painting. With this in mind, the family boarded the small steamer Santa Ana in the New York Harbor. Pyle planned an extended trip with his family to Italy in 1910 to study the work of the old masters. You know, I did not think much of the old masters seeing them in black and white, but in color they are so remarkable that I do not see how any human being painted as they did. You stand among them and you feel you are surrounded by a glow of soft, ardent colors in which the yellows and browns are the predominant tone, and the wonderful blues and crimsons are the relieving note. Two pictures of Botticelli I saw yesterday are the most remarkable pieces of color work that I have ever seen in my life. One of them in particular, a rich, dark gray with a crimson tone, is so remarkable a piece of color that I do not think of anything to parallel it. All the time I was there, I kept thinking of my pupils and wishing that they could see these pictures. In Genoa, Pyle suffered a severe attack of renal colic. Partly recovered, the return journey brought on another. The heat was heavy in Florence and they fled to the hills at San Domenio and later to Siena. Here Howard was able to recover enough to enjoy the beauty of that town. But the journey back to Florence brought on another attack. The illness was diagnosed as Bright's disease, an ominous kidney infection. He slipped into a coma and he died a few days later on November 9, 1911. His ashes are in the American cemetery outside Florence. The news of his death abroad came as a shock. There was a group of students still in Wilmington hopeful for Howard's friendship and criticism when he returned. Most left, but a nucleus remained, having formed an attachment for the region, their experiences, and their purpose instilled in them by Howard Pyle. <laughs>